Hi, this is Marius Innerstate, and I would like to welcome you to another tutorial for Cytrans production where I present some of the methods and tricks I personally use in my music productions. On this tutorial, we will talk about one of the most basic, widely analyzed, over discussed, and yet most difficult sounds to master in Cytrans music the kick. This subject has been discussed and presented by many top producers of our scene, and there are numerous videos on YouTube providing valuable information on how to design your own kicks so we will not spend that much time on the how to create one, but rather explain in depth what to look out for during the process and why. Since the subject of kick design is quite complex for the newer producers, I think it would be best to break it down into individual parts for a more coherent flow. In part 1, we will talk about the fundamental principles of kick sound design, and in part 2, about the details we need to look out for during the process. Before we begin, please allow me to give my personal opinion on the subject, and present certain facts and tips that might help, especially the younger producers. Maybe the most important lesson you will learn throughout your music production careers is the importance of proper studio acoustics. Everyone has been a young producer once, and we all wanted the best possible monitors, or the best sound card, or the best synthesizer, or what have you. And yet, once you do buy them, you realize that the difference in your productions is not as much as you would expect. It might take you a couple of years to realize, or half your career, but eventually it will always come to this factor, studio acoustics. The amount of detail you will have to work on in order to achieve professional sound quality, especially in sounds like kick, bass and snare, is so great that you will need to hear the smallest of details when it comes to EQ, reverb, stereo width and so on. It's the small details that make the difference, so I would personally advise to set it as your top studio investment priority. In order to create a really good sounding kick, you will most definitely need to work in great detail as far as the design, the shape, the tonality, the EQ and the overall process. Most of the times you will be required to make minute mouse movements to achieve fine details, so it's always preferable to also see how these movements affect the kick rather than just hear them. Many times our eyes spot details that our ears cannot, especially in poor treated rooms. So I personally advise you to have a good waveform scope oscillator always open during the process. The three most difficult and most important sounds that can make or break a track are the kick, the bass and the snare. Any of the three can sound good to you on their own, but if they don't sound perfect when played together, you will rarely achieve the unity, density, clarity and dynamic sound of your favorite top producers. If you get these three sounding perfect when played together, then most than 50% of the difficulties of a professional track are already behind you. These sounds are the core, the fundamentals and the driving force of Cytron's productions. So, since we are talking about the kick in this video, please keep in mind that there is no perfect kick. What I mean by that is that there is no universal law that defines what is or how to create a perfect one. You will find a huge variety of kicks in numerous top quality tracks. These kicks might be different in length, tone, shape or perceived loudness but they all seem to sound perfect for that particular track. The reason lies in the combination with the other two important elements, but most importantly the bass. So always make sure that the last and finest of adjustments in the kick are done together with the ones of the bass. It is advised to make these fine adjustments in the beginning of your studio sessions, preferably in the morning where your ears are fresh and more sensitive to the details. For the purposes of this video, we will be using the most commonly used VST for kick synthesis, the Kick 2 from Sonic Academy. Kick 2 came as the successor of what was once the most widely used kick synthesis VST called the Bassism. Of course, Bassism can still produce a great variety of kicks, but Kick 2, in my opinion, has more advanced features and options. To be able to visibly inspect the whole process of the kick creation, we will use the Ozilos Megascope in the master output. Ozilos Megascope gives us the opportunity to really zoom into the fine details of the waveform, ideal for what we will be working on in this case. Alternatively, you can use any type of waveform oscillator like the Vengeance Scope or the Smexoscope from Smart Electronics. Having said all that, let's proceed to part 1 of our kick tutorial. One of the first issues that you might encounter when you design your kick 
is that when you finally render it to audio, it might be too long or too short. Even though there is no rules on how long the kick should be, it's widely accepted that in the most common side trance kick and bass pattern of triple bass, the duration of the kick is two sixteenths of a bar. An easy way around this issue, avoiding unnecessary audio bounces, is to pre-calculate the total length of the kick during its creation. To do that, we need to use a simple mathematical equation. The equation is 60,000 divided by the BPM equals the MS. But why 60,000 and what does this number represent? The answer is very simple. There are 60 seconds to every minute and 1000 milliseconds to every second. So 60 times 1000 equals 60,000 milliseconds per minute. Now add the BPM of our track in the equation and you can easily find out how many milliseconds we have per beat. Using as an example our current project of 140 BPM, the calculation goes as follows. 60,000 divided by 140 equals 428.57 milliseconds. That is the length of one whole beat in milliseconds, meaning from the beginning of our first kick to the next one. Taking under consideration that our kick occupies only the first two sixteenths, meaning half of the whole beat, we now have to divide this number by two. So, 428.57 milliseconds divided by 2 equals 214.28 milliseconds. And that is the total length of our kick in milliseconds if we need it exact. Let's do that again with another example. Let's say our track is now 146 BPM. The equation goes as follows. 60,000 divided by 146 equals 410.95. Now, we divide this by 2 and get a result of 205.47 milliseconds. That should be the length of our kick in milliseconds at 146 BPM. Another way to calculate this number is to highlight the exact area that our kick will occupy. Double click on the highlighted area of audio or MIDI channel to create an event. Right click on the selected area between the locators. Change the view from bars and beats to seconds and just see on top the total length of the event in milliseconds. Now, let's put the theory to the test. Setting the default kick to waveform preset as an example, we just need to set the millisecond bar at the bottom to the correct length and then bounce it to audio. For fine adjustments, we can zoom it in from here, or keep the control button pressed while doing the fine settings. As we can see from the render audio, the waveform length is exactly where we want it at the end of the second sixteenth. Is this the only way to set the length though? As we will see from the next example, it is not. In our second example, we will be using the preset for one of the kicks I designed for my audio sample pack Cytrons creator. As you will see, the length of the bar is set to 942 milliseconds, but when I render it in audio and drop the sample to the track, the actual length is 214 milliseconds, as in the previous example. To understand what happened in this case, we need to switch to the amp section of kick 2. There we will see that there is one node before the last one that completely closes the amp envelope at 214 milliseconds, allowing no further cycles of the waveform to be present until the end. So in practice we see that regardless of the total length of the length bar, we can still determine where the waveform will stop by simply eliminating the volume of the waveform with one new node before the last one, set to zero at the required millisecond. When it comes to designing a kick, maybe the most important factor that will determine how the kick will fit together with the bass is the tonality or the note of the kick. It is common for a lot of producers to start designing their kick simply by using their ears which can serve the purpose of getting a track started, but to get perfect results in combination with a bass, you have to work with the utmost accuracy and detail. So how do we actually tune a kick and set it to the desired note? To examine this issue and its importance, we need to pay close attention to the nodes we set for our pitch curve. The kick is nothing more than a waveform starting on a high pitch and sweeping down to a lower pitch. I personally tend to use four to five nodes and try to have a gradual pitch reduction curve. Is this the only way? Of course not. You can use as many nodes as you like at any tonality if it fits your kick creation preferences. 
So which node of all actually defines the note of the kick? Regardless of how many pitch curve nodes you will use for your kick synthesis, the tonality of the kick is defined by the lowest one in frequency, usually the last one. That is because the first nodes we use are so high in pitch and short in duration that our ears cannot define a tonality in those frequency regions. The lower the frequency drops and the longer the distance between nodes, the easier it is for the ears to perceive and interpret the tonality. As demonstrated here, the lower the frequency drops, the bigger the distance between the cycles of the waveform get. The node we will choose for the kick will determine the exact distances of the waveform cycles between the last two nodes of the pitch section. The lower we get, the bigger the distance gets. The higher we get in pitch, the shorter this distance gets. This principle, of course, applies also to the bass and all other sounds. So, if we know already the note of our bass, we can easily set the ending note of the kick to match the tonality of the bass. When the kick and bass are in the same note, then we have what we call a matching phase or phase alignment. Phase alignment is the most crucial factor and the starting point in achieving an ideal kick and bass coexistence. It's what will give your kick and bass the feeling of one solid unit and the necessary density and solidity required to build the rest of the track upon. The question that might arise at this point is whether it is necessary for the kick and bass to be in the same note in a track. The answer is no. You can have the kick and bass in different notes, but due to its complexity, we will examine this issue at another future video. As mentioned in the introduction of this video, there are numerous top-notch productions out there with totally different sounding kicks. However, in most Psytrance productions, we usually see a couple of dominant shapes. In the following examples, we will analyze their shape and sound characteristics. The first and most common shape looks like this. At the beginning of the waveform, we have the transient, which corresponds to the click sound of the kick, followed by sharp decay and the transition part. This part usually eliminates the frequencies of the kick around the 3 to 500 Hz area, but its usage, in my opinion, doesn't serve the purpose of an EQ, but rather to create a distinctive audible distance between the click and the body of the kick, which immediately follows the transition. The body of the kick defines the density or punch of the kick, and it's followed by the tail, where all the sub-frequencies lie. In this last part is where the tonality of the kick becomes more apparent than any other point of the waveform. To have a clear view of what frequency region every part of the kick represents, we can open an EQ on our kick 2 channel, create a bell, and by sweeping the whole frequency spectrum we can see how the kick waveform gets affected by which frequencies. This can also be used in reverse when shaping the decay and transition section in kick 2. During the amp adjustments, we can see in the analyzer of our EQ exactly which frequencies get affected from our settings. This helps us shape our decay and transition area in accordance to our kick EQ preferences. Knowing the parts of the kick and what audible characteristics they represent, we can now look at another example of a commonly used kick shape. The most obvious differences between the two are in the shorter length of the decay and transition part. This introduces the body of the kick a lot earlier, resulting in a more round sounding kick with a more apparent punch. Obviously, there are numerous more shapes. Knowing what each kick region represents, we can more easily experiment and make our adjustments according to our preferences. Now that we analyze the fundamentals of our kick design, it's time to examine one by one three of the most important aspects and crucial details of the process for better sounding results. As mentioned in the intro of part one, to achieve great sounding results, especially in sounds like the kick, we need to work with the utmost precision and accuracy. That means that we really need to zoom into the details of every move we make to know how those details affect our results. One of the details most new producers fail to pay attention to is the accurate frequency settings. That can occur either when EQing their kick or when setting their pitch nodes in their kick synthesis. 
to demonstrate what I mean by accurate frequency settings, I will zoom into the last note of my pre-designed kick, which is placed at G sharp. What most producers do is setting all their nodes according to the note indicated. But with a closer look at the node, we immediately spot a big margin of movement within the frequency range of the G-sharp indication itself. We see that G-sharp becomes visible at around 51 Hz and stays the same at 52, 53, almost reaching 54 Hz. Does a difference of 2 Hz really count? Let's see. What we'll do to demonstrate it is duplicate the exact same kick 2 instance. On instance 1, we will have the last two nodes set at G-sharp at 51 Hz, and the second at G-sharp at 53 Hz. Then we will render each one and overlay the two resulting waveforms one on top of each other, once in Cubase, and once again in the Oscillos Megascope. It is obvious that the small difference of 2 Hz creates a huge difference in the phase of the kick, and as mentioned, this part is crucial when we try to align the kick together with the bass. So when it comes to frequency setting, I personally always use this chart, which has the exact frequencies of every node in an 8 octave range. As we will see, the exact frequency our nodes must be for G sharp is 51.91 Hz. Since the kick 2 only gives us the option of 1 Hz as minimum movement, then we will round up the 51.91 Hz as 52, since it's closer to 52 than 51. Applying the same principle to all nodes in the pitch section, we have to set them at the exact frequencies or their closest possible real note frequency. Another thing that we need to really pay attention to besides the frequency of the nodes is their correct placement. Not so much for the high pitch nodes, which is a matter of preference, but rather for the last two. As shown previously, the length of our kick occupies the two first sixteenths of the beat. In our usual Cytrons pattern of triple bass, the second half of the kick will overlap the first sixteenth of the bass. If the kick and bass are tuned on the same node with accuracy, then their phases should align perfectly. But do they always? For the kick, the factor that will determine their perfect phase alignment or not lies in the node right before the last one. In several YouTube tutorials, I have seen numerous examples representing a node placement that looks roughly like this. A few nodes at the high frequencies and then one long continuous curve until the last node. If that practice suits your kick and bass preferences, then I have no personal objection to it. At the end, only the audible result counts and not the process. What I personally suggest is to accurately place one node exactly in the middle of the kick. How do we find the middle? by dividing the already known length of our kick in milliseconds in two. In our 140 BPM case, that would be 214.28 divided by two equals 107.14 milliseconds. By placing a node there and matching it frequency-wise with the last node, we know that our second half of the kick will always maintain its frequency accuracy and in effect the same wave cycles within it. The nodes before that can be wherever we like, but these last two are what will really define and maintain our selected kick node. To demonstrate the differences, we will use our kick from the previous example. By duplicating the instance and deleting this node out, we will create the long curve while maintaining all the other nodes identical. Now, if we render both and overlay them, we will immediately see that there is a difference in phase. The difference becomes even more apparent when we see it together with the bass. In our Zillow's Megascope, we have the option of seeing the bass waveform together with the kick. In our first example, we will use the kick which contains the node, and in the second example, the kick that doesn't contain the node mentioned, but rather the long curve. In one case, we have perfect phase alignment,
In the other, we see that the distance between the cycles gets disrupted. That happens because in the middle of the kick length, at 107 milliseconds, which is the first point of contact between kick and bass, the actual pitch is now closer to D rather than G sharp. If we were to create a new note directly on the curve at 107 milliseconds, it would be on D, thus creating an inconsistency in the phase cycles from that point on. Since in the second case we don't have any major phase cancellations, one might think that the placement of the node in the middle is not that important, and that a kick can coexist with the bass without any significant audible differences. Therefore, allow me to present yet another good reason to have it rather than not. Keeping the node in place is a very useful tool when we encounter bass lines that have the exact reverse phase than the one of the kick, as seen in this example. Instead of reversing our bass sample which will result in losing all its frequency characteristics and color, we can simply use the curves between the nodes to add half a cycle to the kick without losing any balance and relativity between the nodes and perfectly align the two. If we didn't have the node in place, the curve would still phase align the two, but significantly change the character of the kick because it would affect the balance of a much greater waveform length. As we mentioned already, the importance of accuracy when setting the frequency nodes also applies in the EQ settings of the kick. Our natural approach when EQing the kick or any other element is to use our ears to bring into the desired frequency balance and color. Sometimes what we choose as ideal point to our ears doesn't really correspond to an exact note, but maybe somewhere in between. My personal approach in these cases is to round it up to the closest real note either upwards or downwards, using the frequency chart mentioned earlier. In a well-treated room, you will find that what your ears usually define as a good EQ spot is really close to the exact frequency of a real note. In addition, you might find it easier to use the frequency point of an EQ to shape the fine details of the kick rather than play around with the placement of the pitch or amp nodes in kick 2. If, for example, we want to eliminate or boost one specific cycle of the kick waveform, then you can achieve that by creating a note in the EQ, finding the corresponding frequency to the specific wave cycle, and eliminate or boost it accordingly. This practice is really helpful in the last fine adjustments of the kick, usually when trying to fit kick and bass together, because the EQ can offer greater accuracy and precision than the amp section. If we try to make these adjustments from the pitch section, then anything we touch would most likely disrupt the whole kick sound since it will interrupt with the cycles of the waveform throughout its length. A balance between fine amp node corrections together with carefully placed EQ points will eventually lead to a good sounding kick. Having said all that, we have now reached the end of this tutorial. The details of kick synthesis stretch way beyond the information we mentioned in this video, but I believe we have established a good understanding of the fundamentals and a few good techniques for a better sounding kick. All the links to the plugins and sources used in this video will be available in the description below. I hope you have enjoyed the video. If you find the information helpful, please give it a thumbs up and drop your comments down below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and stay updated on all new videos and upcoming tutorials. Bye bye.